Please be seated. God bless you. Good to see you. I don't either. Did somebody lose it? Or is it are they trying to tell you something? It's a multi use room, so who knows? Well the biggest part's the clock. <laughs> and it's March twenty seventh. So praise God. I'm excited too, just by what I sense, I mean, from everybody and uh and how cool is it, I mean, really to have this opportunity in front of you to, to grow your congregation and, and break all the uh, records and, you know, kind of, you know. It's not competition, obviously. But, it, you know, it's somehow, you know. I mean, it, it's not a competition. But, and we don't, you know, judge ourselves by ourselves. But uh, wouldn't it be just, hey, yeah, it would be, it would be, just to have an explosive growth in your congregation and then see your congregation, you know, you know divide and explode. And praise God. Anyway, good to be here. Greetings from my wife who couldn't be here. She's with my 92-year-old mom who lives with us, and uh, so we got to, we got to, we got to orchestrate how we move around, and anyway, thank God, hallelujah, I do not have marijuana eyes, even though it looks like it. I left home at 1.30 this morning and drove here, figuring that it would take that much time to fly anyway, I mean, really, and it's cheaper to drive, I guess, and uh, so, you know, by the time you go to the airport and stand in the line, take your shoes off and your belt, and then, you know, blah, 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 and then you sit down, and da, 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 and then, then you get delayed, and then, you know, and then the engine sucks in a goose on takeoff, and, you know, you got to change planes, and <laughs> praise God. Anyway, let's see. What are we doing here? Okay. Uh yeah, I've done a couple of weird things. It may be a little bit of, maybe the the lack of sleep. But uh, so I got to the hotel, beautiful hotel, just awesome. You know, it's the best hotel I've stayed in in a long time. <laughs> and uh, so uh, you know, I got in there and took my shoes off and laid down. I said, "I this is going to be awesome," because I had three hours of sleep when I when I by the time I had left. And uh, there was one particular part of the drive where. Uh, all of a sudden it went like 40 miles went by and I didn't know what happened in those 40 miles. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I sat down on the bed and then I, you know, I kind of lay, I laid down and, uh, and then housekeeping. So, uh, okay. So I get up, you know, and I go to the door and she said, uh, checking out <laughs> I said, uh, actually I'm just checking in. Oh, well, you need anything? I said, I can't think of a thing. Well, if you think of anything, let me know. And uh, so that was that. So now my eyes are propped open for a while. And so then I, I laid down, and, and I actually fell asleep for about five minutes. And actually, then the door, you know, it was like they were trying to open the door. So I thought, well, I better get up. So I get up, and, uh, and it was the huge basket of stuff. I mean, it's like 50 pounds of stuff was delivered to my room. Thank you very much. Literally 50 pounds. And I ate like 10 pounds of it. And then I, so then I'm you know, back and then I'd forget it anyway. So it's good to be here. Good to see you. But they're not, these are not pot eyes. There was a time when they would have been. But uh, the Holy Ghost fixed that. Fixed it instantaneously. That's the neat part. Do you know, I mean, one night, gone with the wind. <laughs> and then the next night, full of the Holy Ghost. So, Okay, what we're going to do tonight, I'm going to, I, I kept telling myself in this afternoon while I had all this time to, to think, um, that I was going to start by saying, you don't mind if I don't preach or teach long. And, but we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Praise God in the Antioch tradition. 
I'm going to be reading in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, and uh, thanks for the opportunity, and uh, uh, I'd really like to... uh, I'd really like to be able to convey something by the power of the Holy Ghost that will help some people. Uh, This is going to be very teachy-like. And I'm going to talk about something. Well, let's read read, uh, one verse, and then I'll tell you what I'm going to teach about. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse number 17. And this is actually on the Indianapolis Star newspaper right underneath the thing that says Indianapolis Star on the front page. Underneath of that is 2 Corinthians 3.17. It's been there for years and years and years and years and years, yeah. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Praise God. Uh, I'm concerned, I'm always concerned about something. I, I, I get concerned about the lyrics to songs. I get concerned about the way we don't say the name Jesus enough. I get all my furs rubbed the wrong way when people sing about Jehovah. And I, you know, it's just, just those kind of things just go over and over in my mind because I want to be, as, as the bishop would say, I want to be apostolic. Uh, I want to be, I want to be a follower of the apostles doctrine And um, I want to be careful about the Word of God and how it affects me and affects ministry and that kind of stuff. So I'm always thinking about these things. And and I was thinking, and I have to quickly substitute a word. Let me check with your pastor. (laughs) Thanks. I was down at Life Tabernacle at James Kilgore's church back in the day, and I used the word crud in the pulpit. And, uh, you know, this was like 19-something, I don't know. And I turned around, and he was sitting there, and I said, is it okay to say crud in the pulpit? He said, well, you've already done it now, (laughs) twice. You know, so anyway, he laughed about it later. So one thing that I'm concerned about lately is, and I haven't gotten my mind around this completely, but let me just see your reaction, and that'll help me ponder it a little bit better. I'm a little concerned with the, uh, the word that I checked with Pastor Wright about was wuss. And if that's not the word that I want to use. I want to, I want to extend that word into a noun that's called wussification. And I'm concerned. <laughs> these are real. It's not. No, it's, these, are, these are regular eyes. Uh, I'm concerned about the wussification of the church. I mean, there, you can teach for days about the wussification of Christian men. Am I telling the truth? Because they're, they're in bad shape. And if they'd stand up and be who they're supposed to be, We'd, ha- we'd automatically have revival. And anyway, so it's been like that for a long time, though. It's been like that for a long time. But, I, but it, it, the church as a whole, I, here's, what, here's what got me thinking about this. You know, we, the, the, the epistles, the New Testament epistles are full of exhortations and teaching and comforting concerning the trials and tribulations of life on the earth. And rightfully so, because the first, the, what, what we call the primitive church or the first church suffered, genuinely suffered at every turn. They were persecuted, beaten, enslaved, uh, mistreated, abused, um, cast out, martyred, uh, thrust, I mean, burned out of their homes, uh, commanded to leave cities. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila when they show up to, to first uh, meet up with Paul, they've been expelled with, with all Jewish uh, citizens in Rome and, you know, throw on top of that that they're, they're oriented towards Jesus Christ and it just made it work. So these people genuinely suffered. And, and so when I began to think about this wussification of the church, I was thinking in the context of our sufferings and how we deal with our sufferings and how we go to God to relieve us of our sufferings. And then I began to compare that 
with the actual with the actuality the the reality of the fact that that these things that afflict everybody in the world christian or non they go through disease and cancers and death and loss and bereavement and tragedy and they get kicked off their jobs wrongfully sometimes rightfully they uh, they they have financial troubles and nine times out of the ten they get through it they get through it with the help of counseling they get through it with the help of their friends family they get through it with the help of drugs or with alcohol or opiate abuse they get through it nine times out of ten and I mean they may not be completely unscathed but they live to see another day and they get through it now when we go through the same things we make a big deal about going to God and having him deliver us from these things now rightfully so because he is our great God and our great comforter and a great father but some of those sufferings and a, and a big part of those sufferings are just life happening it's not like you're singled out and you're walking through this terrible valley that nobody else has ever been through. It's just life happening. And then we cry and, 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 then we, and we get disjointed when God doesn't deliver us from that particular valley, but he just expects us to endure until the end. So where does the North American church find its place in the tribulations and the valleys and the trials and the, and the sufferings that the New Testament epistles cover so well. Where does, that, where does it come? Where does it enter into our lives and our experience and our ministry? And it dawned on me that part of this wussification thing is that we're not trying, now stay with me, we're not trying the impossible enough. We're not challenging ourselves enough. And so, now don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I love this church and I love everybody in it and everybody that ever was and ever will be part of it, okay? But uh, I'm going to temper a little bit about what your loving pastor said as a pastor would and should and did about thanking you and, and God bless you for being here and, you know, your busy schedule and you took time out and you're here on Thursday. Good for you. <laughs> but really, I mean, big deal. This is who we are and this is what we do. This is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. Um, the church needs to look for some impossible stuff. I'm not talking about creating fantastic stuff that's beyond the, the reality of the kingdom of God, but to attempt things that only God can help you do after he gives you the, the command to do it. Just be, be, be aware, be vigilant, and be sensitive to what God is challenging you to do. And then jump into it and watch what God will do through a faithful people that are willing in some cases to sacrifice and suffer and suffer persecution or, you know, whatever it may be. And watch God deliver you and deliver those that you're ministering to. Does that make any sense? Yes. Because if we don't do that, then what are we doing? See, we're using all this grace of God to just be delivered from all the things that everybody just goes through anyway. And that sounds kind of wimpy to me. Now, I know, I know I've got, you know, 30 plus years in Africa watching Africans suffer at every turn. And, I mean, I, you know, you go to villages and you see people and, you know, it may be, a, it may be, a, it may be an impacted, do teeth get impacted? Okay. Well, how about infected? It may be a tooth, a gum infection. You know, now what's this guy going to do? <laughs> he can dig it out with his pen knife or a sharp stick, I guess, but... You know, that isn't going to bode well. I mean, there's no dentist around. I don't know when he's going to see a doctor. I don't know whether there's any antibiotics. I don't know. Unless we bring him some kind of medical care or, or direct him to where there is medical care and, and get him there, how's he going to get through this? 
He's going to pray. He's going to go to the altar of God and say, Lord, this is, this is really painful and I need help. And God's either going to deliver him or not. And if he doesn't, then he's going to live through this pain until something falls off. And then he's still going to live for God and he's still going to rejoice. You know what I mean? Because that's just the way it is. Or in politically sensitive areas, people are, you know, you can't do this and you can't do this. And yet they still do it. And they do it with great faith. And the power of God is manifest because they're doing and living, I guess, what we would consider to be impossible. So when we say that, you know, with, you know, with God, all things are possible, you know, and with man, it may be impossible. Maybe the reality is that we're just not challenging ourselves enough or letting God challenge us the way he wants to. Now, second, that's just, that's just a thought, okay? Tell me what you think later. Go to my website and, no, I, you know, I don't have one. Uh, let's see. I'm concerned about liberty. I'm concerned about the way liberty is used, the word liberty is used. Um, a couple of years ago, I think it was a couple of years ago, but anyway, some, some recent time, I know it was here at Antioch, uh, and I've, I'm sure we've sung it in other places where I've been, but there's a song, I don't even know the words. I don't, I don't like the tune. I don't, I, the, the, the song doesn't do anything for me, but it really turns on a lot of congregations, and, and I, I'm happy for that. It's just not my thing. It's not, that's just not my song. That, that, one, that thing about uh, the one we sang at the beginning of tonight, that's, that's, that's my song. I like that song. I really like that one. I remember the first time somebody came over from America at a big conference in, in Southern, at a big Southern African, I mean, joint conference, and they sang, um, I am a friend of God. Oh, Lord, that just sent me over the moon. <laughs> I am a friend of God. I, I could have sung that thing all night. Anyway. But the one I'm thinking of, of is uh, Breaking Every Chain. Bre you like that? Do you? Do you? Do you? Okay. See, it's, it doesn't do much for me. Um, how does it go? I mean, that's all. That's the only part I know. There's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. To break every chain. Is that it? The whole thing? That's it. What? There's an army rising up to do what? And do what? No, I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking out loud. So you got all these broken chains. You know, it's time to head to the recycling center. You know, I don't know how much steel goes for now, but uh, there's a, there's one we sang in the church where we go now um, in Harrodsburg, Indiana, and I don't know how, I don't know the words of it too, and I I don't even like the tune on this one, but but I. You know, I, I worship during it to my own way. And it's something about freedom to walk in liberty. We have freedom to dance. To, to, you know that one too? Do you like that one, sis? No, it's all right. You're, I, listen, I don't, I'm not faulting. I'm glad it, you know, it's just freedom to walk, freedom to dance. Freedom to dance in liberty. And I'm thinking, what? Wait, you don't even need liberty to dance. You just dance. You want to dance? Here's the floor. You don't need liberty to dance. Freedom to walk in liberty. What? Yeah, hallelujah. That's right. And I'm thinking, what? This is, anyway, so. So what do I do? You know, when I'm in the throes of these uh, controversies, I, you know, I got to stick my nose in the book and figure out what's going on. Because either I'm in big trouble, you know, because I'm missing the whole point that everybody else is getting, or, you know, I'm being enticed into singing something that I don't understand. I'm not talking about you, because you get it. I'm just not there yet. And so I have to find out. Anyway, so... Here we are in 2 Corinthians 3 and this verse 17, that the Lord is that spirit. Now, I want you to open your Bibles or just listen. You can listen if you want to. But I think, really, if you've got one, open it. 
2 Corinthians 3, let's start with verse number 1. Here's the context. God, gross bug, you're hopeless. Here's the context. Paul, there's, there's, let me bring the navy into this. There's negative scuttlebutt going on in, in the Corinthian church about the apostle Paul. Um, he defends himself. In 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he, he defends his ministry in written letters. Um, and this chapter 3, the beginning of it, is, is heavy on this apology. I don't mean that. I mean in the, in, the, in the religious context of an apology, a defense. This is his defense of his apostolic authority. And... And he's such, a, he's such a beautiful man and a beautiful saint and a beautiful thinker and an intellectual and a writer. The way he says it is just superlative. Look at verse number one. Do we, now the we there is the apostles. Do we, and this is Paul and his company. Paul and the ones that travel with him. The ones that have been with him to Corinth and established this work of God. The, he says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Now, what he's really specifically referring to is the habit that they've already started. By this time, they've already started. In fact, at the end of Acts chapter 18, you remember Apollos? You know, who had, who had, tink, who had taken the, the, the few disciples in Ephesus to the place of the baptism of John for repentance? And pointing them forward to an, a, a Messiah that would come, but he but he was he didn't know anything after that. And Priscilla and Aquila get a hold of him at the end of chapter 18, and they teach him the word of God more perfectly. And then Apollos heads for Macedonia, and he's he's going to find his way down into Corinth. And what they did with Apollos is they sent him with a letter of commendation, a recommendation. Because otherwise he might just show up in Corinth or in Philippi or, you know, in Berea or Thessalonica. He might show up with one, in, in one of these groups and say, I've got a word from God. And, um, you know, somebody might say, well, who gives you authority to share it with us? So they, they taught him and then they gave him a commendation after they approved of the doctrine that he had received and, and, and had convinced them that he understood and could articulate it himself. So, so Paul, is that, that's, the, that's the reference. Do we need, do we, do, do I, the Apostle Paul, and my, my, my contingency here, do we need letters of recommendation? From ourselves, or do we need as some others, and, and not only was it for Apollos, but this is a practice that they're beginning to, to use and, and to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to establish the authority of apostolic teachers. Do we need as some others letters, uh, epistles of commendation to you or letters of com commendation from you? So when we leave, do we ask you for letters so we can go to the next place? No, here's the beautiful part, verse number two. You are you. You are our epistle. If I need a commendation, all I've got to do is look to you. Anybody can look at the Corinthian church and see something. It may have its problems, but it's it's got a great foundation. And there's great people there. And that's the commendation that I that I can stand on. That's that's that should speak well enough of the ministry that God's given me to see you saved and to see you built up. You are our epistle, and, and you've got to listen to this because there's a point that I want you to see here about, about what real liberty and real freedom is. It's not freedom to dance. It's not because you don't need it to do that. You just need feet or arms or a wheelchair or whatever it is you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us. Listen, written not with ink. You are our epistle. You are a commendation. And you're not written with ink. 
but with the spirit of the living God and not written on tables of stone, that should smack of something in the Old Testament, but in the fleshy tables of the heart, which sounds exactly like the prophecy of Ezekiel about the coming Holy Ghost. And such trust have we through Christ to God were not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. In other words, our, con- our commendation is you and what God did in you through our ministry. But, but don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that our sufficiency brought about this ministry which produced this spiritual fruit in you. But our sufficiency is of God who also has made us, that's the apostles, able ministers of the New Testament. That's what we need to know. We need to be able ministers of the New Testament. The apostles knew something. The apostles knew that if somehow, it was almost like their continual hope was that they could serve as truly able ministers of the New Testament, knowing that if they could do that, then their hearers would turn to the Lord and this veil of Moses that he's about to talk about would be taken away once and for all. Now, before I read on, which we need to do, I want to go back down to verse 17. Now, the Lord is that spirit. See, the Lord, no, the Lord is that spirit. But if you go up, if you go above 17, that the Lord is that spirit. But that spirit is not in 16. It's not in 15. It's not in 14. It's not in 13. There's no reference to the spirit here. Not in 12, not in 11, 10, 9, 8, countdown. That actually is, he's referred to this as a huge parenthetical uh, passage. And what the, the Lord is, that spirit, that spirit is referring all the way back to verse number 3. The spirit that wrote in the hearts of these believers and established them in the faith. That's the spirit that he's talking about. And where that spirit is, there is liberty. Now, let's do some, some, just some simple doctrine, okay? The simplicity of Christ is this. There is a seal of your faith. Let me tell you how to get saved in case you never hear it around here, okay? You need to repent and you need to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. You can repent and not be forgiven because you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name. Repentance and and remission of sins and baptism go together. You can't have one without the other. You can't baptize somebody who's not repenting and he can't actually conclusively say that he's repenting if for some reason he's refusing to be baptized in the name of the one who suffered and died for him. Amen. So the contact with the, with the blood and the, uh, and, and the sanctification process, the beginning of that sanctification process takes place through repentance and baptism. And when we do that, that's our part. When we do that, God seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise what it says in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul wrote in in another place that when you're baptized into Christ, that you put on Christ. So when the Holy Spirit of promise is given to you, when we receive the Holy Ghost, it is a seal from God, by God, on us concerning the expression of our faith, our holy faith based on the word of God and our obedience to it. And at that point, God's righteousness is imparted to us. You with me? So where the spirit of the Lord is, when the spirit is written on your heart, not on the fleshly tables of stone like the old covenant, but the new covenant would be the, 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 the law of God and by, written by the spirit of God. And not only would he give us what he wanted us to do, but he would give us the power to do it. Okay, are we, are we all together on this? And I want to thank you for coming out on Thursday night. Because the spirit helped you do that. And I'm not even laughing or smiling about that. The spirit helped you 
do that. And what you did was simply obey. Now you may have you may have conjured up a whole new schedule for Thursday evening and you're proud of it. But the bottom line is the Holy Ghost inspired you to do it. And all you did was obey. And that's a good thing. Praise God. So, you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Another word that can be used instead of liberty is freedom. Freedom to dance in liberty. No, not that one, not that kind of freedom. And it's not a freedom that breaks every chain either. It's not, and I'm going to show you what it really is. But let's keep reading. Verse number six. Made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, that's the law, but the Spirit gives life. Because if, if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, and it was, it was so glorious that when Moses came down from the mountain, his face shined with the glory of this covenant that God had made with Israel. So it was so rich and so supernatural that he ended up covering it with a veil. I mean, how symbolic and metaphorical was that? So even when they went to look on Moses, they couldn't stand it. So he puts a veil over his face. The same way that the same law that he's carrying in these tables of stone is going to put a veil over Israel and cause them to believe the wrong thing. They end up believing the law in the wrong way, in the wrong context, and using it for the wrong reasons. And they end up with a form, a terrible form of self-righteousness instead of a true form of repentance and submission to God. So if the ministration of death written and graven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, that glory was to be, taken, was to be done away with. It was glorious, but it was done away with. Then how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Because if the ministration of condemnation be glory, then much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. So this thing had glory, and yet here's the Spirit in men. Here's the law written in stone, glorious, Moses shining with the glory of God that's contained in the law. And yet God fills men, fills them with his spirit and his presence and his power and his grace and his mercy and his love. And what does that do to this glory? Seeing then that we have such hope, verse 12, we use great plainness of speech. Beautiful, that's Paul. That's Paul. That's Pauline. That's what he does. That's how he writes. He's a poet as well as an intellectual. We use great plainness of speech. Plain, easy to see, concise, clear, no veil, unhidden. And not as Moses which put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded because up until this day there remains the same veil Thousands of years later, is my math right? Thousands of years later, the veil is still there. Untaken away in the reading of what? The old covenant. Every time you read it, it was really just pointing out your unrighteousness. That's all it did. It showed you the perfection of God. And the reaction should have been, Oh God, we need a savior from ourselves. But they didn't get it. They started thinking they could practice these points so perfectly that they could actually create their own righteousness that way. That God would have to, in fact, accept them as is. But the veil was done away with in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil, stay with me now, See, there's a veil on people's hearts. And they need to be delivered from that veil. That's what he's talking about. He's going to get real specific now. And he's going to talk about 
Israel needs to be delivered from this veil. But where their veil is, there's no liberty. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, and the Lord is that Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty because there's no veil. Because people understand. They really understand. And it's not spinning a twirl on the floor in church. That's just an added bonus. And you can do it anywhere you want to anytime if you can get away with it. Go to Hardy's and do it. It's easy. On that greasy floor, man, you can spin. I can moonwalk on those floors. <laughs> Nevertheless, verse 16, when it shall turn to the Lord, the it is Israel. So when Israel turn, the, Israel is the, here's this, here's this whole Here's a whole race of people. Here's a whole culture, a whole nation of people that have a veil that keeps them separated from the real glory of God. Are you with me? So when it, that's Israel, shall turn to the Lord, then the veil shall be taken away. That's why Paul wants to be an able minister of the new covenant, the new testament. Now, here's 17 again. So what does it? It's the Lord. And it specifically, it's His Spirit. The Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Verse 18, finally. But we all, with open face, no veil, with open face, beholding as in a glass, that's a mirror, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So when the veil is taken away and the Spirit comes to reside, then it's like looking in a mirror. But when you look in the mirror, you don't just see yourself. The first thing you see, this is God's mirror. This is God's gift to humanity. You look in this mirror and what you see is the glory of the Lord. You don't, see the, you don't see the veil over Moses' face. You, see the, you look in this mirror and you see the glory of the Lord. Now listen. And we are changed. Let me start the verse over. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So when the Spirit comes, I know I'm talking to Holy Ghost filled people. I know that. I'm not that dumb. I know that. But I'm telling you the real deal here. But when the Spirit resides in you, you're able to look in this glass, this mirror, and you see the glory of the Lord, and then you watch yourself changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Now that's real liberty. The real change begins as we sincerely see the glory of God. And then we're changed into the same image by His Spirit. So here, here's what the liberty of 2 Corinthians, or the New Testament for that matter, here's what that liberty is not. Okay? It is not, and this one's obvious. It's not some kind of fleshly, carnal freedom to sin. You know, it's not like, well, okay, you, you can do this and then quickly repent and get away with it. That's not what it is. That's not what, the, that's not what this liberty is. You're not free to go out and abuse the grace of God. We know that. Number two, it is not a freedom from every restriction. In other words, it does not break every chain. Now, it could break every chain, but it won't break every chain. Because you're going to be restricted. And you can't just go out and do anything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't. You'll never become President of the United States. Even though we could use you. Because we sure don't have one right now.
some chains will never be broken until you get to the other side. Some sicknesses you'll never be delivered from down here. I'm not saying that there are certain diseases that can't be healed. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there are certain diseases that will not be healed down here. That's just the way it is. And if you can't deal with that, you've got a real problem. You don't understand real liberty, and you're using it for the wrong reason. Number three, liberty is not a constant, abiding, supernatural power that frees us in all things at all times. If you get hungry, you're going to have to figure out a way to get a hamburger. Because angels aren't going to do it for you. You're going to have to work. Or retire or whatever, you, or borrow or stand on this corner with a cardboard sign. And finally, this liberty that we're talking about is not a power to break every barrier that seems to be holding us back. Now, this is, the, this is probably the most relevant and most important one, maybe the least obvious of the four. Sometimes there are things that we think or they seem to be impeding our progress. But, but be careful because how are you measuring this potential progress? Is it based on what you want to see happen or is it clearly founded on what God wants to happen? And you've got to be really careful about that. Where should I be according to what I see in this glass? Not where I want to be. But where should I be? Now let me wrap this thing up. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, I want you to look at verse number 9. And I want you to look at the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know the bishop wrote a book. I, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure he wrote a book about grace. He beat me to it. I've always wanted to write a book about grace. I may still do it. I don't know. But grace to me is just, it's just, it's so, to me it's simple. It's just simple. I don't even know if it's worthy of a big book. But it, it's just simple. Grace is what God gives you to do what he wants you to do. Amen. It's just what he blesses you with. Yes. He favors you so that you can carry out his will. Yes. So that you can get up every day and you can get to the harvest field and you can be productive and fruitful for him. You can impact the world. You can be, you can be a, a, a fruitful member of his family. Grace is what he gives us to carry out the mission. If we're not careful, we'll abuse that grace. We'll use what he gives us for the wrong reasons. James warned us about heaping, about praying for things, and, but the real goal is we just want to heap these things upon our own lusts. That we, I mean, you can just imagine people earnestly in prayer over a $700 million lotto. Earnestly, I guarantee you there were deep prayer meetings going on all around the world, the country. Oh God, if you would just give me this, then I would do this. Yeah. No, you wouldn't. You know, God's sitting on his throne getting a chuckle and saying, you're an absolute idiot. You think I'm going to give you $700 million so that you can go and you fall off the edge of the earth and be lost, you and your family, get divorced, look like an idiot in front of the whole world? And you think I care about $700 million in a lotto? What does God care about $700 million in a lotto? What does that have to do with his kingdom? Nothing. And people are earnestly praying and fasting about it. Oh God, if you just heaping things on their own lusts. Grace, that's not grace. You know why you're fit enough to be here on Thursday night? Because of the grace of God. He said, you can come, you can do this. You can pay, you can give your tithe. I've taught every. I've taught tithing for years and years and years. I've tried every, figure out every clever way of teaching it, 
But the bottom line is I tithe and we tithe because, because we can tithe. That's it. I don't do it to get blessed. I don't tithe so I can give a testimony six months later about how God rained down $100,000 in my life. That's not what it's about. I tithe because I can. I tithe because God blessed me with this. And I can tithe. I can do this. I can put this into the back. I can sow this back into the earth. And watch what comes forth. It's not about greed. It's just because I can. It's by the grace of God I do this. We've been healed of various things. We've had expert surgeons cut out various body parts from us around the congregation as we get older. They cut out more and more stuff and put in all kinds of new stuff. You know how that happens? It's because of the grace of God. It may be medical intellectuality. Intellectuality? There's no such word as intellectual, intellectualism. What is it? Intelli okay. Okay. Science. But it's really just the grace of God. You have a job by the grace of God. You have a house by the grace of God. You can have too much of a house. You can take 83% of what God gives you and put too much of it in the house. And abuse the grace of God. Got to be careful. Got to look at what the God directs you to do with, with what He gives you. What he, what he favors you with. That's Bible, brother. Look at the grace of the Lord in 2 Corinthians 8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. See, he needed the grace of God. God in the flesh needed the grace of God. Otherwise, he can never carry out his mission. There's no way. So you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich. In other words, he could have had everything because guess what? He had everything. Yet for your sakes he became poor. That was the grace of God on Jesus Christ. When I become flesh, I'm going to empty myself out and become nothing. So that for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might be rich. Look at the grace of the apostle, on the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, where he says, I will glory of the things which concern my accomplishments. Oops, that's not what he said. Which concern my infirmities. If I'm going to glory, I'm going to glory about my weaknesses. Because when I am weak, then he is strong. That's the grace of God on the Apostle Paul. And that's why when he prayed to be delivered of that messenger of Satan that buffeted him for so long, God simply said, my grace is enough for you, Paul. This is where I have to keep you, right here in this pain and in this torment or this persecution or whatever it was that tormented Paul. He would not be delivered of that on this earth. And so Paul learned to glory in his weaknesses. That was the grace of God on him. Look at true freedom in its truest expression in Romans chapter number 6, starting with verse number 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, then his servants you are to whom you obey, whether it's of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin in the past. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So then being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Now let me tell you what this let me tell you what this liberty really is biblically, okay? In Matthew chapter number 11, Jesus tells his disciples how they can walk together with him. And liberty for them is a yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is Easy, my burden is light, but it's a yoke. Liberty is a yoke. You're not free unless you're in the yoke. Break every chain. Don't break the yoke. In 
in Matthew 16, if any man will follow me, let him take up his cross. Jesus wasn't singing on the Via Dolorosa, dragging that timber on his shoulder, three quarters dead because of the beating they gave him hours and hours and hours before up until then. He wasn't singing break every chain. He wasn't concerned about liberty to dance. He was just trying to get to Calvary. So liberty in Matthew 16 is a cross. <laughs> and let me finish with this. Psalm number 139, and this may be somebody's favorite psalm because it is an awesome psalm. But I want you to see it in a new way. Oh, Lord, where's, where's liberty in Psalm 139? See if you can find it. Oh, Lord, you've searched me and you know me. You know my down-sitting and my uprising, and you understand my thoughts from afar off. You compass us, or you circle my path. You surround my path and my lying down, and you're acquainted with all my ways. For there's not a word in my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you, you know it all together. You've beset me behind and before, and, and you've laid your hand upon me. You've covered me from every direction, up, down, back, forth, right, left, forward, this way, that way. And then you've laid your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful. It's a, it's a secret to me. It's high and I can't attain unto it. Verse 7, where shall I go then from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I, if I ascend up into heaven, then you're there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Now tell me what liberty is. Free from the hand of God? Free to do whatever we want and claim it's in Jesus' name. I can have anything, do anything, go anywhere. I can cast out any impediment. I can jump over any wall and run through any troop. I can, I can overcome every obstacle. Uh -uh. It's a yoke, it's a cross, and it's a hand. I remember when I looked, when Joel looked up to me physically. Joel was a case. Some of you need to hear his story all over again. It's like a, it's like a novel. He was, he, the poor guy, he was even a promise. He was a living, he was the incarnation of a promise. I mean, you talk about heavy. It was a heavy few months in the church. God's given me a son and he's going to be a symbol of the revival and, and everybody in the church is going, oh God, I hope it's not a little girly. And Joel pops out, here I am. And Joel would, he would make, he would make trips to the bathroom, not alone either. He was always, seemed like you were always being led somewhere, you know, and, uh, but the picture stands out. I mean, it's not just Joel. It's anybody. It's any small child, any toddler. See, toddlers are just, they're remarkable little creatures. They do the funniest things. Totally dependent. They act as if they're totally independent. They're always testing the boundaries. Tell them, don't go out of this room. And they'll, I mean, just take your eye off for a couple minutes and, in, in two minutes, they'll be at the door threshold looking at you, you know, with the door open, ready to step out to see what your reaction, because you just said, don't go there. Now they, because if they can get away with this, then your words don't mean anything. They're learning, they're learning, they're learning. 
character, learning how to be them, you know. But to be honest, the happiest and most secure, the greatest promise rests in those days when his hand is in the hand of a loving and caring and guiding parent. You're safe. You're secure. I'm going to take you where you need to be. And I'm here right with you. I've become an expert over the years being with my wife, whether it's in America or in Africa, wherever it is. I'm the guy that waits in the car, you know, while she's doing some quick shopping, you know. So I've just become, a, I've become I'm an observer. and It's amazing how men deal with children differently than moms. You know, my, I mean, <laughs> This SUV will pull up, you know, and the door opens, and like 20 minutes later, she's got him in the thing, you know, and the, the thing flipping and the unlocking and flipping, and then, and, and she's got a purse and a phone and, a, you know, bags and the baby, and a t -t 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 or she's got a, and then she's got a toddler, and she's got all this stuff, but boy, I mean, that hand is on that toddler. It's very rare to see a mom that doesn't have her hand on that baby. Now, Dad, sometimes they're pretty cavalier. They're expect you know, like, grow up. Now, you just follow me. You know, Dad's teaching them life lessons. Now, follow me, son. Get over here, you know. But I guarantee you, it's, it's, I'm sure it's just a subconscious built-in toddler thing, but, man, when that hand locks in, unless they're having a really bad tantrum day, when that hand locks in, it's like you become one flesh. So I'm telling you what. That's what I want. For my liberty, that's what I want. I want to be yoked. I want to carry my cross according to his direction. And I want his hand on me. I don't want to be, I, I, what I want to be free from is sin and stubbornness and the pride of life and the self-contentment of great earthly gain. And I want to be delivered to a greater and a deeper submission to God's will. And I want him to help me to tenaciously grasp his almighty hand and never let it go. Let's stand. I believe this. I believe if we would seek that. Oh God, how can I say this? Adequately. There's a, all these cares of life that just, they just ensnare us, don't they? There's not a mean spirit in what I'm about to say. I'm just, I used to live here. I, did, I didn't have any money in those days, and I wasn't too concerned with the rat race because I wasn't smart enough or rich enough or clever enough to make a race out of it. I, but I'll tell you what, when I come back from Africa or when I drive here from Indiana now, wow. I mean, Maryland has this thing. Drivers. I mean, you just cross the state line and everybody's like goes crazy. Ooh. Man, phew. I gotta get there first. I gotta cut you up. I got and and I'm not, you know, I'm not angry at them. I mean, because they got places to go. They gotta make that that jack. They gotta get there. They gotta beat, they gotta beat the other guy. I don't know how they're doing it without their phones. I don't know how they can constrain themselves. They must be cheating. Or, of course, they're doing this. They've got the hands free. They're, making, they're sealing deals on the way to the intersection. Because it's the, it's the thing. It's just, it's like a, it's just this thing. Got to do this. Got to, got to live like everybody else. I got, to, I got to have this stuff. And the bottom line is we really just need to back up a little bit. And say, God, what do you want me to have? What do you want me to do? Thursday? Yeah, man, I'm there. Some extra teaching, I'm there, I'm in, I'm all in. Teach Bible studies, absolutely. Just lead me, Lord, take me.
Take me where you want me to go because this is where I feel the best with your hand locked in mine. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. We're here for you. We're here because of you, Jesus. Lord, your word tells us to look into the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of liberty. And by doing so, God, we would become not just hearers of the word, but doers also. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we believe in your promise for this church. We believe, Lord God, in your promise for this congregation of Antioch West. Loose your will, God, in us, through us, Use us, God. Save us to the uttermost and help us see so many others saved. God, we reach out our hands knowing that yours is a hold of ours. Oh, God. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your opportunities, Lord. The privileges that you've bestowed upon every one of us. Bless our homes now and our families and our jobs. Bless the work of our hands, God. Bless our time. Oh, God. Help us be found in your field and in your harvest more than ever before. In the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Hallelujah. God bless you.